at the right hand of the poor to save him from those who condemn him. We will greatly praise the Lord as we gather together this afternoon. May he be glorified by our service here. All right, let's open up our Psalters, uh, the Psalms of David and Meter, to Psalm 123. It's a short psalm. We'll sing all four verses printed in two stanzas. In verse 1, O thou that dwellest in the heavens, I lift mine eyes to thee. We look to God, we trust in him, we revel in his love, and we worship him. Let's do so now as we sing Psalm 123. join together in prayer. Our Father in heaven, we humble ourselves before you, acknowledging that we have no right to enter into your presence, but this is what you have called us to do, because you have loved us in Christ. You have enabled us to know you. You have revealed yourself to us, and so we can know something about who you are. Lord, in your greatness and your fullness, we can't possibly begin to comprehend the depths of who you are. But you have revealed something about yourself, that you are a, a gracious God, a loving Heavenly Father, that you are infinite in power, that you are everywhere, that you know all, that you are perfectly wise. So, Lord, we reflect upon the wonder of your attributes. And we are so privileged to be able to know you. Lord, we are so weak. We know so little. We just can't comprehend uh, the big picture. But you know all things. And you are working all things according to the end that you have appointed. That you are working history along the lines that you have determined for it. And so, Lord, we know that even though there are times when we can be so frustrated by the way things are going, so worried about uh, the future. We can wonder why there is so much hostility against your truth. And we see that so many just deny reality. 
deny uh, the way things you made them to be and are so hostile to your rule over all things. And Lord, we could so easily be swept along with such thinking and so easily imagine ourselves so wise and, uh, and humanity so great. Lord, we only can be who you have made us to be, and you have given us an incredible mandate to be stewards in this creation. Were it not for you, we would be nothing. Were it not for your truth, we would know nothing, not really. Were it not for your providential care, we would have nothing. But thanks be to you, O Lord. Uh, we are provided for, we are blessed, we are, are loved, and we are granted an incredible assurance that you will always be our God and we will be your people because of your glorious promises. Father, we thank you again for this congregation. We pray a blessing upon your people in this fellowship. We thank you that we can again be gathered together on this Lord's Day. We thank you for those who are here in this building and also for those who are joining in by electronic means. And Father, we pray that we may have a sense of our being a community where you are praised. And Father, we thank you again for the denomination of which we are a part. We pray for our various congregations. We pray for your servants who are preaching your word from our pulpits on this Lord's day and that you would grant them wisdom and boldness and clarity of speech that your truth may go forth. We pray for your word wherever it is proclaimed in this land on this day. We pray, O oh Lord, for our nation. We pray for those in positions of leadership, for those elected to serve in government, for those who work in the various departments. We pray for those involved in military service, for police officers, for those in the judicial system, lawyers and judges, for prison guards. We pray, O oh Lord, for teachers. We ask that more and more of them may come to recognize that there is no real understanding of what life is about, what this world is about, apart from seeing you as the creator, as the sustainer, as the ruler over all. Father, we pray for all those in the educational system, students and volunteers. We particularly pray for um, brothers and sisters who are involved in this whole matter of education. That you would help them to be faithful. Father, we pray for the world in which we live. We're thankful for the beauty of the creation around us. We're thankful that we can have a sense that it all points to you, that creation has structure and order because you are the God of order. We thank you also that you are certainly not in the least confined to this creation, for you are infinitely beyond it. And yet you have loved us. 
and you keep us. Father, we ask that you would be with us now as we continue on in our service this afternoon. May what we do here together be done to the honor and glory of, of your holy name. Guide us now, we pray, humbly in the precious name of, of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. So we're going to read from Genesis chapter 33. We'll read together the first 17 verses. So, reading from Genesis chapter 33, we begin at verse 1, read, reading through to verse 17. People of God, hear his word. Now Jacob lifted his eyes and looked, and there Esau was coming, and with him were 400 men. So he divided the children among Leah, Rachel, and the two maidservants. And he put the maidservants and their children in front, Leah and her children behind, and Rachel and Joseph last. Then he crossed over before them and bowed himself to the ground seven times until he came near to his brother. But Esau ran to meet him and embraced him and fell on his neck and kissed him, and they wept. And he lifted his eyes and saw the women and children and said, Who are these with you? So he said, The children whom God has graciously given your servant. Then the maidservants came near, they and their children, and bowed down. And Leah also came near with her children, and they bowed down. Afterward, Joseph and Rachel came near, and they bowed down. Then Esau said, What do you mean by all this company which I met? And he said, These are to find favor in the sight of my Lord. But Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob said, No, please, if I have found favor in your sight, then receive my present from my hand, inasmuch as I have seen your face, as though I have seen the face of God, and you were pleased with me. Please take my blessing that is brought to you, because God has dealt graciously with me, and because I have enough. So he urged him, and he took it. Then Esau said, Let us take our journey, let us go, and I will go before you. But Jacob said to him, My Lord knows that the children are weak, and the flocks and herds which are nursing with me. And if the men should drive them hard one day, all the flock will die. Please let my Lord go on ahead before his servant. I will lead on slowly at a pace which the livestock that go before me. And the children are able to endure until I come to my Lord and see her. And Esau said, Now let me leave with you some of the people who are with me. But he said, What need is there? Let me find favor in the sight of my Lord. So Esau returned that day on his way to Seir. And Jacob journeyed to Succoth, built himself a house, and made booths for his livestock. Therefore the name of the place is called Succoth. So far this reading, God's holy word. Let's continue our worship of the Lord our God as we give our evening offering. We join together in prayer once more. Our Father in heaven, we lay before you this offering. And we pray, O oh Lord, for uh, the ministry 
of this congregation. We thank you, O Lord, for the opportunity to contribute to it. We pray that the money that is collected may be administered well. We pray that um, all the resources that we have, that we use, that we may use them in your service. Whatever we have been given, O Lord, it is a gift from your hand and is to be used, remembering that it's not simply for our own selfish purposes. We are here to serve you, and we have what we have as stewards in your service. Bless us now as we continue to offer a service of praise. May you be glorified. And we pray again for your servant who preaches. Lord, this is a glorious privilege and an important responsibility. May his words be faithful to your word. Bless us now, we pray, in Jesus Christ's holy name. Amen. So, um, once again, a few words before we turn to our uh, New Testament reading. Well, this afternoon we continue our look at the well-known and much-loved parable of the prodigal son, or better named, the lost sons. Recapping the story so far, it's a story of two sons, which begins with the younger of them demanding, Father, give me the portion of the goods that is coming to me. Father, I can't wait for you to die. Give me my inheritance right now. And the father, instead of punishing him, grants his request. The younger son takes his inheritance and journeys to a faraway country where he wastes his possessions with reckless, prodigal, wild living. He was foolish. What he was doing was wasteful was shameful, and of course his funds were fleeting. So no surprise, the money soon runs out, and a severe famine hits right about that time. He needs a, to get a job to support himself. He becomes desperate, so desperate that he takes a position that would have been the ultimate disgrace for a Jew. He feeds pigs. He's left with absolutely nothing with no one willing to provide assistance. And having reached rock bottom, he comes to his senses. He begins to understand the truth of his situation. And he repents. He knows he has sinned against heaven and against his father. He has not been the son that he should have been. But perhaps his father would show mercy. Perhaps he would at least let him have the benefits that come with being one of his hired servants. Well, after practicing the speech he would give upon his return, he heads off back to his father, back to the family that he had brought so much shame upon. But before he arrives home, his father sees him and shockingly, Instead of snubbing the son who had so deeply hurt him, he runs to him. The father smothers his son with hugs and kisses. And the son, truly repentant, begins to say, Father, I have sinned against heaven, and in your sight I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But before he can go any further, the father makes it clear that whatever this young man may have thought about himself, he would always be his son. Bring out the best robe. Put a ring on his hand. Put sandals on his feet. And if all of that weren't enough, bring out the fatted calf. The calf being kept for a special occasion and let the party begin. 
an amazing story painting a beautiful picture of the love of God, a beautiful picture of restoration, of who God is as the Heavenly Father who longs for our salvation. Well, that could have been the end of the story, and it in and of itself is an incredible story, an amazing story. But the story does not end, not even close. The older son has been hanging around in the background, but now, now he comes to the fore. So please turn with me as we read our New Testament reading and text for this afternoon from Luke chapter 15. We pick up the story at verse 25, and we read through to the end of the chapter. Luke chapter 15, beginning at verse 25. People of God, hear his word. Now his older son was in the field, and as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo! These many years I have been serving you. I never transgressed your commandment at any time, and yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me, and all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and be glad, for your brother was dead and is alive again, and was lost and is found. So far this reading of God's holy word. All right, let's um, sing Psalm 16. We're going to sing all 11 verses printed in the five stanzas. In verse 11, we conclude our singing of this psalm, Thou wilt show me the path of life. Of joys there is full store. Before thy face, at thy right hand, are pleasures evermore. We praise God as we sing Psalm 16, the whole psalm.
So, brothers and sisters, the, the contrast between the younger brother and the older brother in this parable, this contrast could hardly be any starker. The first we read of the younger brother is of him demanding his inheritance, wanting complete control over his portion of the family estate right then and there so that he could liquidate the assets, take the money, and run. The first we read of the older brother is of him working on the family estate, taking care of that property, which supported the extended household, which in essence already belonged to him. The younger son shown to be irresponsible, the older son appears responsible. The responsible son makes his way home after a hard day's work. And he can't help but notice, hmm, something unusual is taking place. It seems there's a celebration going on. But he hadn't heard of any parties being planned. So what's going on here? He calls one of the servants over, hoping to get some information. What's the meaning of all of this? And the servant fills him in. Your brother has come home. Because he has arrived home safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. Now, interesting that, as Jesus tells the story, the servant says nothing about the state of the younger son. There is no clear indication here that he had returned home destitute. For all the older son might have known, his younger son had, the younger brother had gone off, made his fortune, and had now returned home to pay back that which he had so foolishly and arrogantly demanded of his father. The estate would then be restored to what it had been before he left. Not a likely scenario, given that this young man had obviously been a fool, but you never know. That would certainly have been a good reason for the father to throw a party. Nor is there any indication in the servant's report that the younger son had returned home repentant, acknowledging the shame he had brought upon his family. No indication that the young man had come to his senses that he realized what a fool he had been, that he was not coming back looking for more, for more money. That also would have been a good reason for celebrating. No, all that the servant says in Jesus' telling of the story is that the prodigal son had come back safe and sound. They certainly were not celebrating because he had come back in triumph, which he obviously hadn't. Nor were they specifically celebrating because he had come back destitute but repentant, which he had. In terms of what is being reported to the older brother, it was simply enough that he had come back. Well, in the mind of the older brother, this was not good enough. It was not reason enough for making merry. This fool had reduced the size of our estate by such a dramatic amount, he has humiliated our entire family, and now we're celebrating simply because he didn't actually get himself killed? It would have been better for everyone if he had. The older brother is angry. He's not happy that his brother had come back. He's not even curious as to how his brother may have changed during his time away. He is simply ticked off, and he refused to go in. Now, here again, we have another striking contrast 
between the brothers. The younger brother, who had removed himself from the family, he was at the family celebration. Whereas the older, responsible brother, who had remained loyal to the family, he refused to join the festivities. The outsider was in, and the insider was out. So what happens? Well, just as the father had taken the initiative to run out to the younger son while he was still far off, so now the father again takes the initiative, this time going out to the older son. He didn't make the younger son come to him, nor does he do this with the older son. And the father then pleads with his older son. He entreats him. One scholar interpreting the Greek word used here suggests that the father is speaking tenderly to his son. It's not about him demanding that he come and show his face at the party. He doesn't deride or criticize his son for his unwillingness to face his younger brother. He just wants this older son to share in the joy. Now, who knows what the father was saying when he pleads with his son? Was he telling him about how his brother had returned home destitute? Did he tell him about what his older brother had said? How he acknowledged that he had sinned against heaven? How he freely admitted that he didn't even deserve to be considered his son? Did the father make it clear in his pleading that this brother who had come back was not looking to make any claims in the family estate? Did the father remind his older son about how sorrowful he had been all the time while his younger son was off gallivanting in a foreign land? not knowing whether that son was alive or dead, hoping against hope that this day would come when he would return. Surely, the older son must have been aware of what his father had been suffering since the departure of his brother. Did the father talk about how this huge burden had been lifted off of his heart? that he was so thankful that he could once again have a relationship with this child whom he had loved and lost and could now love again. Whatever it was that the father said, the grammar here suggests that this was not just a simple matter of saying, I really want you to come in, and then leaving it at that. No, the father's pleading, it was sustained, ongoing, extensive but it seemed that, would, that it would be to no avail. The older brother's anger is not abated. Lo, he starts off. Look here, pops. Pay attention to what I'm telling you. Listen, I've got something to say to you. There is a definite sense of disrespect as to how it is that he addresses his father here. This is not about him listening to what his father has to say and answering him courteously, engaging in a reasonable discussion. This was about him telling his father where it's at. Look, these many years I've been serving you. All this time I've been the respectable son. Actually, what the older son says here is more than that. Basically says, I've been working my tail off for you. You know, the word uh, said to have been used by the older son, the word served, 
It can probably be better translated slaving. You know, the word used uh, just a couple of verses earlier, referring to the servant who had reported to the older son what had been happening. That word suggests someone who is in a fairly good position in the household. But the word that the older son uses to talk about his work, describing how he had worked for his father, that's related, in fact, to a word referring to a simple slave. I've been working, not like a son, not even like a respected employee, but I've been working like the lowest of slaves for you. His son didn't appreciate how how he was part of the family line, working the inheritance given to them by God. He didn't see himself as a privileged part of the long-standing purpose of God from generation to generation, blessed by God as stewards entrusted with a gift that provided all that they needed. No. Instead, what this older son does is he plays the victim card. I'm no better than a slave to you. We see here, here really, not a contrast between the two sons, but a striking similarity. The younger son, when he left, He didn't see the value of being part of the family. He had plundered its wealth and escaped to a foreign land. And okay, while the older son may not have abandoned the family like his younger brother, he didn't seem to have a much better view of his role within the family. By the way, brothers and sisters, it would be easy for us to have a similar attitude toward being part of the family of God like the, a similar attitude to what the older brother had. All right? if, if being a Christian is for us just about doing our duty, if it's just about slavishly keeping rules, if it's just about giving the appearance of respectability, giving the impression that we're good, moral Christians because we do all that we're supposed to do, rather than our faith being about rejoicing in the privilege of being part of God's family, rejoicing in the wonder of being able to know God as our Father, loving him with all our heart, all our soul and mind and strength, simply for who he is and what he has done for us in Jesus Christ. If that's not what our faith means to us, if it's just about regulations and and duty, well then, we don't really understand what being a Christian is all about. So then, so then the older son complains to his father about how I've been slaving for you for so many years. And then he claims, I never transgressed your commandment at any time. Really? He's always been an obedient son? Well, he may have obeyed his earthly father's commandments, at least on the surface, outwardly, but he certainly was not obeying God's commandments. I mean, you have the the basic commandment to honor your father and your mother. The way he was talking to his father at this point, it was not honoring him. And God calls us to think of others' needs before our own. Well, this older son certainly wasn't thinking of his brother's needs or his Father's needs, for that matter, that's for sure. And what about the, the father pleading with him to come and join the festivities? Is the older son saying here that uh, he would have responded favorably if his father made it a command? 
All right, I'll come in, but only because you command it, and only because I never transgress any of your commandments. Something tells me that probably wouldn't have worked. And something tells me that this son was not quite as obedient as he makes himself out to be. He certainly did not demonstrate an obedience that flows from love. If he loved his father, he would have shared in his father's joy at the return of his brother. You know, brothers and sisters, any obedience that that does not flow from love, really, when it comes right down to it, it is in actuality disobedience. God does not call us to be resentful, bitter sons and daughters who only do what he tells us to do because we're forced to. Jesus tells us that if we love him, we will keep his commands. You could turn this around and say that we want to keep his commands because we love him. All right, then, the older son continues to complain. Even though I've been such a great son, you've never even given me a young goat, which wouldn't nearly have been as valuable as the fatted calf. You didn't even let me have that meager pittance so that I might have a party with my friends. His upstanding, respectable friends, no doubt. But as soon as this son of yours came, and and note the contempt in his voice, the barriers he imposes on the familial relationship, this son of yours, not this brother of mine. No, this, as soon as this son of yours came, who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, you killed the fatted calf for him. Now this morning you might remember I questioned how it is that this older brother could have actually known that his younger brother wasted all his money on prostitutes. Was he just making an assumption here? Well, let's just assume, all right, that In the father's pleading with him, the father may have mentioned this for some reason. The younger son humbly confesses to his father, the father who was overjoyed at seeing him again, the father who was smothering him with affection. The younger son admits to him humbly that he had wasted his father's money on prostitutes and and for some reason the father thinks that sharing this information would somehow convince the older son to come and join the celebration even so even if the older brother was entirely correct in saying that this is what the younger brother had done do you notice what the older brother is really doing here He's bringing up the past. He's talking about what had happened previously, not about what was happening at that point. He's talking about who his brother had been before he repented, not about who it is that he had become after repenting. It's about who his brother was, not about who he is. You know, in Ephesians 2, Paul says to his readers, you were dead in trespasses and sins. You were by nature children of wrath. You were living in disobedience, pursuing the lusts of the flesh. But now, 
you are made alive. You are saved by grace. You are raised with Christ. You know, there's this um, North American homeschooling wife of a pastor in a psalm singing church. Sort of like my wife, Julie, and Robin's wife, Vanessa. Anyway, the woman that I'm referring to here is Rosaria Butterfield. You may have heard of her. Incredible story. Unlike Julie and Vanessa, Rosaria, before being converted, was a militant feminist lesbian English professor. She tells the story in one of her books about how, after she was converted, but before she was married, she was volunteering in a kitchen with a sister in Christ, who, in all seriousness, asked her whether it was too much of a temptation for Rosaria for them to be alone together, just these two women. It seems that this Christian lady had a hard time looking past who Rosaria was in order to see her as who she is, who she had become as a sister in Christ. Now this lady that Rosaria wrote about, she probably had the best of intentions. And it wasn't that she refused to have anything to do with Rosaria or that she was angry that this former militant feminist lesbian would become part of the church. At least I assume she wasn't angry. But really, still, when it comes right down to it, she was doing something very similar to what the older brother was doing in the parable and what the Pharisees in Jesus' day were doing with the tax collectors and sinners, focusing on who Rosaria had been, rather than on who she had become. You know, the Pharisees and the scribes back in Jesus' day, they saw how these horrible people were drawing near to Jesus, they longed to be in his presence. They, they hungered to hear him speak the words of life. But the Pharisees, they couldn't get past who these people were. And so they couldn't understand how Jesus had come to draw such people to himself and how these sinners could be saved by grace. These, these Pharisees, they had a self-righteous attitude that really, when it came right down to it, didn't allow for grace. And, and so it, it just didn't compute for them how, how these tax collectors and sinners could be loved by Christ and how by his mercy and grace they could be brought from life or from death to life. And so these, these religious leaders couldn't see how these, these sinners coming to Jesus was cause for celebration. Just as the older brother couldn't understand how his younger brother coming home was a cause for celebration. Which brings us back to the parable. You know, considering the older son's complaint, on the surface, it could have been argued that he had a point. The law of God stipulated that stubborn and rebellious children, prodigal children, they deserve the death penalty. Just look at Deuteronomy chapter 21. But of course, what the older son failed to realize was that in his own very real way, he 
was just as much a stubborn and rebellious child. He was a lost son, just as lost as his younger brother had been. He deserved the judgment of God. He deserved the wrath of his father. And still, and still the father pleads with him, come share in my joy. The father shows love in how he responds to his son's complaining. Son, he says tenderly, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. You see, I haven't given you a goat. All the goats I have, they're yours. Everything I have, you've inherited it all. Even this fatted calf that we're cooking up, it's yours. And you should be rejoicing in the opportunity to enjoy this luxurious delicacy because of this celebration. After all, it was right to make merry and be glad, as our text says. It was fitting. It was right. Not just it was okay. Not even it was good, but it was right. It was necessary. It was essential. What else? What else could we possibly do? Your brother was dead. That's who he was. That's what he came from. That's what he has been delivered from. But now he is alive. This is who he is. He was out of the family, but now he's in. He was lost, but now he's found. And the only conceivable response to this glorious reality would be to rejoice and to celebrate. Well, that's how the story ends. And notice something very important here, all right? Jesus, in telling this story, leaves us hanging. He doesn't say whether or not the older brother did, in fact, end up joining in the celebration. In his own way, this older brother had broken the family, just as his younger brother had done. But we don't read about whether or not the whole family ended up being restored and reconciled. Now you could see that as a challenge to the Pharisees to whom Jesus was originally telling this story. You were complaining about my receiving sinners and eating with them. You were looking down your nose at them. You are imagining yourself so much better than them but you are only looking at who they were, not at who they are, who I have made them to be in my love. As repentant sinners, they are your brothers and sisters in the family of God, and how can I not celebrate their participation in the kingdom? How can you not celebrate this? Are you going to join in the festivities or not? That's the challenge given to the Pharisees. Brothers and sisters, when prodigals return home, when wild sinners are brought into the kingdom, when those whom we would want nothing to do with were we to see them on the street, if we were to see them in the pew next to us, how would we see them? If they were to join with us in rejoicing in the grace of God shown toward them, would we rejoice with them? Could we get past who they were to see who they are 
brothers and sisters, loved by Jesus, saved by grace, just like us. Let's say your inclination is to be somewhat like the older brother and think more about who they were. You don't have to stay outside of the festivities. You can repent and join in the celebration, the celebration that starts today and will go on forever into eternity. You can celebrate the love of the Heavenly Father. Thanks be to God for his saving love and mercy to all his children. All of us were dead. Now we're alive. We were lost, and now we're found. What can we do but praise God and rejoice, rejoice together? Amen. All right, let's stand to pray. Remain standing afterward as we sing and then conclude our service. Father in heaven, just like the Pharisees of old it, it, and the religious leaders in Jesus' day, it, it's so easy for us just to think about who people were. But joining together in repentance of faith, it's not about who any of us were. It's about who we are. We were dead in sins, each and every one of us. We were slaves to sin, gratifying the desires of our sinful nature. We were lost. We were subject to condemnation. But now turning to Christ, because of your mercy, your grace, because of what you have done for us in Jesus Christ, because of the glorious gospel of our Savior, we are found, saved, alive again. And we join with with everyone who confesses the name of Jesus Christ, no matter who they, they were. We thank you, O Lord, for this gospel that, that joins us together, that makes us realize that none of us are any better than any other one of us. We're all deserving of your condemnation but we can all know the joy of salvation together. Help us to revel in this, O oh Lord. Help us to rejoice in what you have done for your people, for your sheep, for your beloved children. We pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Okay, let's um, turn to Psalm 80. We're going to sing the first stanza, which contains verses 1 and 2, and then we'll turn to verse 15 in this same psalm and sing through to the end of the psalm. So the first stanza and uh, the last three stanzas. And in verse 19, we conclude our, our singing Turn us again, Lord God of hosts, and upon us vouchsafe to make thy countenance to shine, and so we shall be safe. Psalm 80, the first two verses, and then from verse 15 through to the end of the psalm. 
blessing, know of his love, his grace, and go your way in his peace. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. <laughs>